Coming up on Tech News Today, Ron Richards joins me again. We're going to talk about Samsung's new ruggedized phone. Podcasts are apparently finally saved from an overly broad patent. YouTube is actually Google's next big messaging app. Foxconn might be coming to Michigan for self-driving tech R&D and a whole lot more. Tech News Today is next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1826, recorded Monday, August 7th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TNT to save 20% off any order. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life, and that's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. And by Eero. Never think about Wi-Fi again with Eero's hyper-fast, super simple Wi-Fi system. And now the second generation Eero is tri-band and twice as fast. For free overnight shipping, visit Eero.com, select overnight shipping at checkout, and make sure to enter the code TNT. Hello and welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we talk about some of the biggest tech news stories with people who are passionate about technology. I'm Jason Howell. Megan Maroney is out once again, but we have the return of my friend Ron Richards. How's it going, Ron? I'm getting real comfortable being inside that monitor, Jason. It's I, good to be back. It's good to have you back. We've got a couple of stories that are tailor-made for you. Yes, there's okay. one in there that's Android, but there's one in there that's comics also. And when I realized that you were going to be sitting next to me on this show, I was like, this is the perfect time for Ron. This yeah, is, good this, timing. This is like what you were made for. This so is, I, you you called and I showed up. The, the, the Ron XO signal went out and I responded. So there you go. That is quite literally <laughs> exactly how it happened, actually. There's very little um, very little talking that up. So uh, so let's start off with some, uh, some news stories here. And this first one, yeah, this feels very comfortable for us. Samsung has a new phone for those of you who are looking for a ruggedized premium smartphone to kick around. Literally, you could kick this one around if you want. The Samsung Galaxy S8 Active is a bit flatter than the curvy S8 that we saw earlier this year. Uh, it has bezels that extend out a bit more to protect against scratches and drops. The metal frame is thicker, uh, polycarbonate backside that meets military grade durability. Not only that, the battery gets a really big boost here from 3000 milliamp hours to 4000 milliamp hours. And I didn't realize this because shatterproof screen seems to be coming more and more of a thing. We saw it with the Motorola phone, uh, the Force, the uh, was it the G2 Force or something like that a couple of weeks ago. It had a shatterproof screen. This apparently has shatterproof screen as well. What do you think? You know, it's you know, it's also going to have a shatterproof screen what? assuming it ever ships is the essential. Oh, really? Is right, that yeah, that was a, wasn't that a shatterproof? That was their whole durability thing, wasn't oh. it? Isn't it a shatter? I, I might be wrong, but I know that I know the titan the titanium casing and making it so that you could drop the phone, it wouldn't be the end of the world. And I'm not trying to co-opt this discussion and talk about the essential phone. I apologize. It's okay. Um, when I did a Google search for essential shatterproof, I got some yeah. wonderful dinner plates from Crate and Barrel that are apparently oh, shatterproof. There it is. Yeah. They're essential. I believe. Plates. It I believe it's shatterproof. I, I could be wrong, <laughs> but I know I know that was a big thing. Is that it was durable? Yes, but I do that's, remember that's, the titanium. Yes. It's interesting though because like I feel like especially in, in you know in the world of Android phones for years these active rugged durable phones have existed. If you remember 5 years ago Jason wasn't I trying to get you to buy one of those? Like I, it was the Cas it was a Casio or something like that. It was some, some weird phone that was like all rubberized and whatever. Yep. yep. Um but uh but it's funny because I never see these in the wild. Yeah. I never see anyone with these phones, but in looking at the render, looking at the photo, I guess it's not a render, but looking at the photo of of the Samsung Galaxy S8 active this looks no different than the ridiculous rugged cases people put on phones. So it's kind of genius to just put that into the case of the phone. Yeah, I mean they're building it in the case. If you if you take a look at the the front shot, you can see the kind of unique. That's yeah. The, yeah, the front shot. You see the unique kind of side bumpers. There's bumpers on the corner, little metal bumpers to absorb shock uh, on but it was drops. The, the, the the back is what looks like an OtterBox case. Yeah, the, and the back ends right? up looking totally OtterBox like. You're right. 
Yeah. Well, I so. mean, you know, in Samsung, I don't know if I've necessarily seen a lot of these out in the wild. I have seen them very rarely, though. Um, so if I'm seeing them very rarely, there's probably more out there than we may think because there are plenty of phones that I've never, ever seen out there. Um, but, I mean, it's exclusive to AT&T for a limited time. So right out of the gate, it's got an exclusivity built into it. But there's a very particular market of people that are out, you know, they're, they're working on construction sites or whatever. Their jobs are really intense and have have high potential for their phones to get dropped and destroyed. And yeah, you're right. Samsung just kind of builds it into this particular style of phone. It's the Samsung brand name, which a lot of people are looking for. If they aren't looking for iPhone, they're looking for Samsung. And you couple that with Rugged and, you know, they're all in. It's 850 as compared to 750 for the S8. And and I would I would think that this kind of as a product feature uh, this rugged extra bit, you know, and also the a big battery helps too. Like this, I could see I, like selling this, this isn't a tough sell, I would imagine in the stores. Like right. someone walks into a Verizon store and like, oh, I want a phone that I'm not going to drop, that I'm not going to break. This checks off all those, all those uh, boxes, uh, $850, that, that's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, that, that's very true. That's very true. But it's, uh, you know, it's good for those with a case aversion. Um, Burke, <laughs> your thing flipped over, but I thought it was pretty funny. Burke said, uh, I saw a Samsung active in the wild. It had a shattered screen. <laughs> I don't know if this shatterproof screen is necessarily something that's been in all of the active uh, models yeah. in the past. It, it was mostly that it was waterproof and dustproof. You're right. And this one has that, but so does the S8. So now they've gone another step and put in the shatterproof screen. So that's kind right. of a new a new part of this. And, and I think it, that's a big one. I need to correct myself. I was wrong. The essential phone has a Gorilla Glass 5 glass. Okay. So, it's not shatter, so it's not shatterproof. But so. I do remember, I know what you're talking about. They were talking about how the yeah. titanium case uh, makes it more resistant to drops and everything. It's just, yeah. it's hard to get around the screen. What I wonder is when you're talking about shatterproof screen and the shatterproof screens that I've seen and the force that we were talking about, the Motorola phone, uh, the screen ends up feeling kind of, it's like a layer of plastic. And it's actually, yep. in the case of the Force, that makes it more prone to scratches. Samsung says that this won't be prone to scratches in that regard. So I'm wondering, how is it shatterproof? Is it that plasticky uh, cover or is it something different? I'm just waiting for transparent aluminum to become a real thing. I know <laughs> we, we saw it in Star Trek IV in 1987 and that was a glimpse of the future. I'm being very patient, but once we have transparent aluminum, then all of our phone problems will be solved. You are being very uh, patient. That's true. Yes. Yep. Uh, you may have heard about personal audio and their pursuit to clamp down on podcasts as a whole using their patent for, and I quote, a system for disseminating media content representing episodes in a serialized sequence. They were using that patent as ammo to do such a thing. Well, for a, quite a while, the podcast industry has had this kind of cloud hanging overhead, threatening the medium itself because of the potential of this patent. Personal audio targeted Adam Carolla, How Stuff Works, CBS and NBC, just to name a few. And the Electronic Frontier Foundation took up the call of podcasters to fight for the format and protect against the broad patent. The EFF wanted to protect independent podcasters, so it filed a petition to challenge the patent in 2013, ultimately winning that ruling in 2015 due to some prior art that was dug up. Of course, Personal Audio appealed that ruling last year, and today, this is my long way of saying today, the appeals court affirmed that the patent is in fact invalid. They pointed to the same uh, two pieces of prior art, which were CBC's Quirks and Quarks and CNN's Internet Newsroom. Both of those dated, pri dated back prior to the 1996 patent that Personal Audio had. So if you were worried that your podcast might change once <laughs> Personal Audio got its claws into it, uh, I, I suppose worry no more. This, uh, this is the time where then I tell everyone to go to the EFF website and donate, please. Yeah. Um, as, as, a, as an active donator to the EFF, and I have been for more than 10 years now, this is why they're here. They are like so much of what I do, and I know, Jason, what you do, everyone does a twit, you know, would be affected by, potentially affected by this patent ruling. Oh, for sure. And, and we all know it's garbage. We, I mean, it's funny because we, on All About Android over the years, we talked about patent trolling and, and the Samsung Apple lawsuit and things like this. This was like literally personal audio trying to, 
you know, leverage this patent to, you know, get a cut of what's going on with podcasting and, and could shape the future of the industry. Um, so the hope now is that this is enough of a nail in a coffin and that they don't try to appeal it further and, and you know, and in hopefully it never even goes up to the Supreme Court. But uh, at this and in this case today, we can celebrate. Let's hope tomorrow it continues um, to stay shot down and please help the EFF and support them because if it, if they do appeal, they're going to need our support. Yeah, the EFF fights the good fight and definitely, you know, that's kind of one of the, one of the things that they called out on this is that this threatened to affect so many independent podcasters uh, because of an over broad patent. Um, it is it is entirely possible that they try to take it to the Supreme Court, but they have no comment on that as of yet. And I guess we'll find out at some point um, whether it would even make it up that far. But uh, as for now, this this chapter has ended. We don't know if we've reached the end of the book yet, though. Yep. There you go. YouTube is rolling out a new sharing feature within its Android and iOS app that will allow users to share videos with their contacts in a chat interface inside uh -huh. the app. Up to 30 people can be invited into a YouTube chat room from any uh, users already in there. So if somebody's in there, they can send out the invite from directly in the chat room and bring people in. It's perhaps a more controlled environment than YouTube comments can be, uh, maybe a little less public than YouTube comments, uh, since it revolves around invites of specific contacts. You are determining who ends up in this YouTube chat room uh, to talk about, well, I guess YouTube videos along with you. Uh, <laughs> how do you think this is going to do, Ron? Well, I mean, at, f at first glance, I groaned, but then I thought about it, and this is really no different than the direct messaging in Instagram, really. Yeah, you know, like true. a friend of mine, could, a friend of mine can take a photo or a video on Instagram and send it to me and several other friends in a group, and there's like a little mini dialogue that goes on there. So I think that I feel like the uh, this is all about nomenclature. If they if if they um, kind of position this as private messaging with friends or sharing messaging with friends versus a chat room. You know what I mean? Like those are two different things. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I, if I can, if it makes it easier for me to send videos to my friends and talk about it, cool. Let, let me make a chat room with up to 30 people to watch YouTube videos. Not cool. So, I mean, it's, I feel like it's doing the same thing, but it's all about how they present it. Yeah, for sure. And I, I, I wonder if it would be maybe a little bit more like, there's always the the knee jerk reaction of oh grown another messaging platform for Google don't yep. they have a million of them already but I I feel like maybe this is a little different I don't know how successful it's going to be but maybe it is a little bit different because it's tied into a particular product like it's not it's not sure. positioning itself to be the next you know SMS chat app for Android it's quite right, yeah, literally it's, it's, like this is YouTube and you like YouTube videos why don't you chat with your friends about it while you watch them yeah no exactly just like like you would not contact me via Instagram Instagram's DMs to see if I can do the show today. You know, there's an appropriate channel for that. But if you see a picture that you think I would like, you send it to me. And like, I think in-app messaging has a place. Like, if these are apps that you're going to, you know, that interact with a lot and use, you know, and 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 use for a specific function, having messaging built in is not a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Um, there, there are some things that are missing that might make it a little bit more appealing, like simultaneously, uh, you know, real time playback for everyone at the same time. That would be nice. Like if you're doing a live chat room, it would be nice to know that everybody's watching the same thing at the same time. You can comment live in real time. And there are other apps. In fact, I think there's one app on iOS that Google created as a 20% project that does that, that takes a YouTube video and plays it simultaneously for everybody, and they can kind of be on the same page and, and chat about it. So there's a little more they could do with this. I'm not sure how successful it'll be, but apparently they've been testing it since May 2016, so last year. It's been it rolled out to Canada in 2017 because apparently, statistic I didn't, useless statistic I didn't know, but Canada shares the most video of any uh, place in the world. Uh, I, random I, I didn't I did not know that either. I think it's because ca Canadians are very polite and like to share things. <laughs> yes, they're very good at sharing. So there you go. Uh, up next. Well, you know, what else? More news with Ron. We've got a few more news stories to talk about. But first, let's take a minute to thank Tracker. They are the sponsor of this episode. There's a ritual to looking for your keys. I do it all the time. Sometimes I have to like re reposition my ritual because it's just never works, right? You, you check the obvious places. Uh, couch, kitchen, pockets, all those obvious places. Then the weird places, you're looking in the bathroom, under the fridge, the laundry hamper. Uh, then you start getting really creative and you start looking in places where it doesn't belong, like the freezer. Uh, eight years ago, Tracker changed everything. 
time when they released their first tracking device, and now they've done it again with the all-new Tracker Pixel. With Tracker Pixel, you'll never worry about losing your things again. Tracker Pixel is the lightest Bluetooth tracking device on the market. You just place Tracker Pixel on whatever you tend to lose. You know what they are, keys, wallets, maybe even your cat. Uh, it's small enough to fit on your smallest items. When you misplace an item that has a Tracker Pixel attached, use your smartphone and a 90 decibel alert will help you find it in seconds. That's super loud. It even has powerful LED lights so you can find your items in the dark, it'll light up for you. Uh, lose your phone, you just press the button on your tracker pixel and your phone rings even if it's on silent. You can even locate your item if it's miles away because every tracker user is part of the largest crowd locate network in the world. And tracker's 30 day money back guarantee means you truly have nothing to lose. Go to thetracker.com and enter promo code TNT to save 20% off any order. That's T H E. T-R-A-C-K-R.com, promo code TNT for 20% off. All right, a few more news stories here. Ron, this story definitely uh, for you. I thought of you immediately when I read it. Netflix <laughs> announces first ever acquisition today. Miller World, or am I saying that wrong? Is it Miller it's World? It's it's Miller World. It's okay, good. Miller. Yeah, All right. yeah. A uh, lot of people a lot of people make that mistake because it's it's spelled Millar. Yeah. But uh, he is Scottish and it is pronounced Miller. All right. Cool. So this is coming in handy already having you on today. Yep. Uh, they're an independent comic publisher. They're responsible for Kick Ass, Kingsman, and Wanted, just to name a few. Uh, Ron, tell us why you think Netflix Netflix picked Miller World specifically. Why is this their first ever acquisition? Well, yeah, really interesting. Like at first, I'll be honest with you. At first, when this when this news broke, I thought it was a hoax um, because Mark Miller, the the, the 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 main guy behind Miller World, is a bit of a prankster, and he often likes to uh, post clickbaity things to get your attention and talk about his next comic or his next movie or whatnot. But sure enough, then I saw the press release. I was like, oh wow, this actually happened. Um, a couple of things to clarify first. Uh, so he, uh, it isn't a co he isn't a comic book publisher. He's more of a comic book studio. Okay. Uh, so so what it is is that he uh, he's a writer by trade. He came up writing for DC. Mark Miller came up writing for DC in the '90s, and then he wrote a lot for Marvel in the '80s. Uh, not the '80s, sorry, 2000s. Um, he wrote Civil War, which was kind of loosely the, the Captain America Civil War movie was loosely based on. He also wrote Old Man Logan, which loosely the movie Logan was based on. Um, but then he had his own comics that he uh, that he published on, a, on his own IP, um, and he published them through agreements with both Marvel and Image Comics. So he did all of the work, and they just published them and handled the distribution. So he's not truly a publisher because he's not handling like you know the direct to store kind of business. The the main comic publishers are still there, but he is a kind of a content studio. Now, why this is uh, why Netflix picked him is because. Of all the comic book creators, and we're in this this age of superhero comics and comic books being hot properties and TV shows and things like that, of all the people who have created comics over the past 15 years, 20 years, he is probably the single most successful creator when it comes to translating a comic to a movie. He has not only oh, had several okay. movies, yeah, he's not only had several movies based on his work, like Civil War and Old Man Logan, like I mentioned, um, but he's taken his own creator-owned properties, like Kick Ass and King and Kingsman, and Wanted, and had them made into movies. For comic book writers and artists, the movie dollar, the movie money, that's like that's Nirvana. That's the dream they want to get to. Yeah. And in the industry, everyone says everyone's like Miller. Miller got stuff made. He he did the impossible. And that clearly got the eye of Netflix. So in this age of comic book adaptations, you know, Netflix doing so well with Marvel and uh, the, you know, Nick Cage and uh, not Nick Cage, Luke Cage and uh, Daredevil and Jessica Jones and Iron Fist and the, and the upcoming Defenders. Clearly, they want to get more into it, but it makes a lot more sense to have one in house than to have to be beholden with a deal with Disney. See, now I feel like there needs to be a Luke Cage versus Nick Cage uh, episode. Yeah, at some yeah point. I know, exactly. It needs yeah, to happen. Yeah. So do you think this is a, this is a, an acquisition that comic lovers uh, can feel hopeful about? Or is this like, oh, man, dad just, dad just came in and, like, you know, told me the thing I like is hip and cool and now I want out? Like, yeah, not, not so. I, I think it's something that, that, that comic fans can get excited about okay. because – um, this is going to give Mark Miller the resources, I, assuming this is going to give Mark Miller the resources to go make more comics, which will eventually get translated into other TV series or movies, you know, produced and distributed via Netflix. That, that's what I'm assuming is the play here. I don't think Netflix wants to be in the business of printing comic books. 
that is that is not a fun business. Trust me, I've done it. Uh, it is also a dwindling business. That 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 business is is getting smaller year after year. Um, even though you'll read the comic sales are up, it's not what it once was. Um, so really what it is is about getting somebody who's immensely creative. Mark Miller is one of the most creative writers in the industry, getting him in the Netflix world and pumping out properties. Because if you look at Netflix, they're releasing something new once a week. They probably want to amp that up. And Miller has a reputation of delivering results. Both Kick-Ass and Kingsman both led to sequels and both were profitable in terms of you know their uh, box office numbers and, and budgets. Uh, Mark Miller has a great relationship with the director Matthew Vaughn, uh, who directed X Men First Class and also directed um, uh, Kick Ass. So, like, Miller is just a guy who is able to bridge the gap between comics and movies, and I bet you that's what Netflix wants. Nice. Okay. All right. So, hopeful, hopeful transition for this. Then, I mean, yeah, whether whether they want to get into comic book printing or not, I mean, it's it's kind of part of the deal at this point, right? Yeah, what I imagine is that they're just going to let Mark do his thing, yeah. you know, the same way that he has been. And every time he has a new property, as opposed to having to shop it to Universal or to Fox or whomever, he just hands it to Netflix and they go and do it. So I, that's a pretty good deal. And I imagine he made some money off of it. So oh, I would imagine so. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, Mark, Mark's one of the, Mark's a good guy. He's one of the good ones. I've had the, I've had the, uh, I've been lucky enough to interview him several times and work with him directly. And his heart is in the right place. He just wants to make fun stories and he does that. So I think this is a great deal and it's good. It's a good thing happening to a good guy. So. It makes me wonder what, uh, this can't be the only acquisition Netflix has ever considered. So it makes me wonder. Well, I, I couldn't believe that this is Netflix's first acquisition. They yeah, never made either. an acquisition. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> um, it's also interesting to note as a footnote that Kick Ass and Kingsman are not included in that deal. Oh. Um, those, those, those are two properties that have already been sold and are owned by other studios. So this just reflects the the current work at Miller World and future work. Got it. Um, yeah, so it's an important distinction. But that said, you know, Miller's made a bunch of comics that are awesome that I wish would get made into movies or TVs. There's one property of his called Starlight, which is kind of like a um, it's a sci fi kind of pulpy kind of Flash Gordon type story that would just be perfect as a movie. And so I'm hoping that sees the light of day from this. Nice. All right. Well, I'm sure there will be plenty to look forward to there. And I don't know how long it's going to take to see the dividends on that, but coming soon. Uh, did you know, Ron Richards, that you may have bought Amazon's very own products when you ordered from Amazon? I didn't realize that. I mean, I, I had heard of Amazon. What is it? Amazon, uh, their, their essentials or whatever. Basics. There we go. Amazon basics. The basics. Right. Yep. Uh, but Mike Murphy from Quartz went digging through more than 800 Amazon trademarks, and they discovered, they confirmed, 19 brands that can be found exclusively on Amazon and are actually owned by the company, even though it's <laughs> actually pretty difficult, or if not impossible, to tell on the product page itself that it's made by Amazon. Outside of the Pinzon brand that lists itself as pins on by Amazon. Uh, the others listed on the site make no mention of their ties to Amazon, aside from a reference to being available, quote, exclusively uh, to Prime members. Uh, so, you know, some of them, Lark and Roe, Mama Bear, Strathwood, Happy Belly, there's a whole list of these uh, these products, that, these brands that you can find through Amazon. Some of them are like tools, some clothing goods, consumer goods, technology goods. They've got their hands in a lot. So in some ways, they're like, triple dipping, right? You know, they've got, they've sold you on your Amazon prime membership. They're controlling parts of the shipping, uh, the shipping transaction. And then they're selling you products, uh, through their store that they're making. What do you think about that? I, it, it's the Amazon way, right? I, know, right? I mean, it's, it, I mean, like, I'm not surprised at all. And like, and the thing is, is that if these were not decent products, we would hear more about it. But the fact is that they're fine. They're just they're 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 able to use the massive clout that Amazon has and their scale to make you know low and and whether they're selling them at a loss or whatever they're doing. But it, it's it, it's up to Amazon. It's not surprising. It's up to Amazon's best interest to not have to sell other people's stuff at some point. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if you know, because if you can control, if you can cut out as many of the middlemen as possible, then that's more profit for the company. So uh, I'm not surprised about it at all. This world brought to you by Amazon. Yep. <laughs> Literally everything <laughs> on it brought to you by Amazon. Yeah. Some some were arguing, at least you know, based on this article that Mike Murphy uh, wrote up about this. Definitely some interesting kind of work that they did into it to kind of find out what what is behind these brands and and how you know how they came to be. But some are arguing that it's kind of a clandestine approach. 
um, which basically, in, in essence, gives a sense that there's all of this kind of variety, choice. all of this yeah, choice, choice, when really yeah. when it boils down to it, you know, it's it's limited to, you know, Amazon and a few other things. Although at the same time, I could I can't tell you personally that that I know of based on looking at these brands that I've ever bought anything that was branded as Amazon. But uh, just kind of interesting that they're not going going through the trouble of, of letting their their shoppers know that it's coming from Amazon. I think it makes a lot of sense that it wouldn't be like clothing by Amazon and car tools by Amazon. You know what I mean? Like, I think it makes sense that they would have a brand that is separate from Amazon, but still that if it's owned by Amazon, it would mention it somewhere, that it would be at least some way uh, possible to, to realize that. What I just like is there's somebody's job at Amazon who is to make up company names. Ah, uh, yes. We go back to that list. It was just like there's some great smitten and rebel yell and like all this like yeah. kind of these. Uh, it's so it's, true. It's very convincing, but uh, I'm not. I mean, yeah. I mean, whether they disclose this stuff or not. Yeah, look at these. Some of these names. They're fantastic. Pike, you know, Pike's my drink. habit. North Eleven. New Pro. Right. Come on. It's my a, habit is consumer goods. So yeah, you know, and, and some of these are, are are named very appropriately to the to the thing yeah. that they're around. Uh, but almost in, in in a somewhat generic sort of way too. But so. yeah, that's the thing. Like you, you show me tools that are you show me tools that are made by Denali. I'm like, oh, that sounds like a tool company, right? It totally Denali. Does. Okay, yeah, that's it's fine. Um, it's it's Amazon. Just it's it's continuing their Amazon. And we're gonna live in it. It's gonna be Wally, but instead of uh, B and L or whatever that company is, it's gonna be Amazon. Instead of Wally, it's gonna be Denali. Denali. Yeah. <laughs> uh, more iPhone eight rumors, though. Some of these uh, we've discussed already. Ready, so you might recognize some of this stuff, but there's mounting evidence that the next iPhone will have a new infrared camera to facilitate in facial recognition, either as an augmentation or even as a replacement of the current Touch ID fingerprint security system. Apple's HomePod firmware that we talked about, I think last week, that it got an update. Uh, has already shed some light on these upcoming features buried deep within the code. But another nugget has now been discovered. Of course, they're pouring over this stuff to try and figure out what they can learn. The code makes reference to a resting feature that would allow for face unlock when a phone is, I would imagine anyways, in a resting state. So, for example, if your phone is sitting on the table and you don't have Touch ID to unlock it, how do you get in it without picking it up and looking at it? Well, this is making reference to the possibility, and it matches up apparently with other rumors, that uh, the IR camera could also work at varying angles. So you wouldn't necessarily have to be looking at it face on. If my phone was resting out on the table in front of me, and I happened to be near it, the IR scanner would be potentially be capable of unlocking because it knows that I'm near it because it scans my face. What do you think? It's pretty cool if it works. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's it kind of has to work, right? If they're actually yeah. replacing Touch ID, it has to work. This is Apple we're talking about here. What, what, what's, fu what's funny is that we have face unlock is nothing new. We, we've had it in the Android world for years, and it got quickly dismissed because it didn't work, right? And so if Apple wants to dip their toe in the face unlock world, it's got to work. And if yeah. it doesn't work, no, you know, like that's, you know, like that's, that's, that's going to be the key thing. I don't care. And like, to say that, oh, it's Apple. Of course it's going to work. Nope. Like it, it's got to work. I, I would have said the same thing about Google, you know, like face unlock is very hard to do. Yeah. You know? Google was doing face unlock a little differently than what these are saying. You True. Know I mean, our yeah. camera, that's, a, that's a different story. Works in darkness. Um, it's neat. It's a good, it's a, it's a nice, t it's a, it's a different take on it. Right. So maybe yeah. it will work. We'll yeah. see. We'll but. certainly see. Bleak, I think, has the title for the day. Resting on lock face. <laughs> there you go. Uh, up, up next, another possible Foxconn investment in the U.S. But first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. They're the sponsor of this episode. Uh, the mortgage experience was not keeping up with the times. If you've ever been through it, you know it's dated it needed a client-focused technological revolution, something to tie it in with what we're used to, which is living our lives online in the, in the digital age. And that's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence that you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple. It allows you to fully understand all the details and also be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. That's all there is to it. It's powerful. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations 
in seconds. It's all based on your income, also your assets, your credit, and Rocket Mortgage takes all of that, analyzes all the home loan options for which you qualify, and then can find the one that's just right for you. So they do all the heavy lifting for you to make it really easy. Rocket Mortgage, buy quick and loans, apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, just go to rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. That's rocketmortgage.com slash TNT, equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. All right, so Foxconn has been grabbing headlines these past few weeks with its announcements that it would be bringing manufacturing plants to the United States, and along with it, a whole lot of jobs. Uh, they aren't done with those announcements, or so it seems. Joining us to talk about the greater strategy of, of this latest news is Sam Boel Smith from Navigant Research. Welcome back, Sam. Hey, Jason, and uh, nice to meet you, Ron. <laughs> hey, Sam, how you doing? It's great to have you back. It's always good to get you on. So the first big announcement involved Foxconn's planned LCD plant in Wisconsin. Uh, but what do you know about the news that Foxconn might invest in Michigan? Well, actually, we know very little about it. There was a report this morning in the South China Morning Post, which is an English language newspaper out of Hong Kong, um, that claimed that Foxconn had struck a deal with uh, the state of Michigan to uh, to put a plant uh, here or to put some kind of facility here, which may be as little as a, an R&D facility or it may be a giant manufacturing plant. We don't really know. Uh, Michigan's governor, John Engler, has been in, um, in China for the past week or so uh, trying to negotiate some deals. And there, you know, there's lots of speculation and there's, there's a few thoughts about what it could be, uh, what Foxconn could be doing. You know, obviously, you know, I think everybody, uh, probably everybody that watches this show knows that um, Foxconn is a major supplier to, uh, to Apple. They make um, most, if not all of the iPhones, most of the iPads. Uh, and they, and they also produce manufacture um, goods for a lot of technology companies. And with Apple certainly developing autonomous driving systems, um, it would not be inconceivable that they would want to have Foxconn as their manufacturing partner uh, here in the U.S. Um, so it's it's possible that, you know, I think if, if Apple's doing this, more than likely they're following a similar approach to what Waymo is doing uh, with uh, designing all their own sensors using technology that they got from their acquisition of PrimeSense a few years ago, mm -hmm. uh, developing their own uh, compute platform for the automated driving um, using their uh, their processor technology that they've designed. And so they could easily have Fox, you know, work with Foxconn to establish a manufacturing presence here. Um, and because there's already a supply base here in Michigan uh, for most of the, the stuff that Foxconn would need. And, you know, Foxconn, one of the reasons that's often given for um, Apple not wanting to uh, move their manufacturing out of China is because of the, the existing supply base that's there that can respond quickly. We have a similar kind of supply base here in Michigan that can provide all the bits and pieces that Foxconn would need uh, to make stuff for Apple or for any other company. Like it could, it could also be Waymo that uh, they're they're working with. It it doesn't have to be Apple, but that would be the the most that would seem like the most likely scenario. And I mean, Foxconn it seems like has been pushing back on these statements that were made by the chairman uh, in the Chinese media on this topic. Why do you think they're not on the same page at this point? Is, was it just going rogue or <laughs> was it? <laughs> um, you know, it, it's hard to tell. You know, it, it's entirely possible that, you know, the whoever wrote this up for the uh, the South China Morning Post, um, you know, may have misinterpreted some statements. Um, it's also possible that, um, you know, perhaps uh, Governor Snyder's, Governor Rick Snyder's um, people maybe um, spoke too soon before everything was nailed down as far as the deal goes. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm sure that uh, that the governor is very anxious to, you know, as a Republican, he's probably very anxious um, to make a, you know, make a good presence, support his party, you know, by bringing more jobs to the state of Michigan. Sure. Um, so, you know, it's likely that, you know, maybe his PR people got uh, a little over enthusiastic, you know, before all the, the details were worked out. Yeah. Um, how, how involved with autonomous vehicle development has Foxconn been in China? I mean, this wouldn't necessarily be replacing the work that they're doing in China. It would just be in addition to, and it sounds like you were talking about the supply base in, in Michigan being a reason why it's good to do it there. 
I mean, how does that tie into what Foxconn is doing as a whole, like kind of as a greater? Um, as, as far as we know, they haven't had any involvement in developing automated driving systems in China. Uh, although, you know, the the Chinese market, um, you know, the companies that are working on this stuff over there, it's much more opaque, you know, just as it is with other businesses. Uh, so it's hard to tell who's working with who over there. But we've not heard any reports at all of Foxconn being involved in this. That said, you know, they produce all kinds of electronic components for a wide variety of companies. You know, their their parent company, uh, Han Hai Precision, you know, has a, a number of subsidiaries. And it's entirely possible um, that, you know, they have some business somewhere that's producing some stuff. E even if they're not involved in the auto industry right now, um, you know, their expertise in manufacturing electronics like, like phones um, could very well be translated over to manufacturing um, sensors and electronic control units for automated driving systems, you know, anywhere. Um, so, oh, sorry, after you, after you, well, I was just because I was going to. So, how does you know, so given this kind of reaction to the chairman and then the the kind of the miscommunication, how does this affect what Foxconn's R and D efforts in its Chinese facilities will be? Like, what what is what does this mean for Foxconn standing? Um, it probably won't have any, I, I would guess it won't have any impact at all. Um, you know, it, it, it seems like, you know, if they're, if they are doing this, if they are going to get into producing or, or developing components for automated driving, I'm not sure what happened to my background there. Um, if they, <laughs> the illusion <laughs> is <they> shattered. <laughs> yeah. Gee, you think I was sitting in front of a lake. I was um, hoping. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so was I actually, um, <laughs> at, at any rate, um, you know, if they, this, you know, this would be an add-on to their existing business. Um, you know, so I, I don't think it would have any impact in one way or the other, whether this moves forward or not uh, on any of the business they're doing already with, you know, with a wide variety of companies. Is it possible that deals like this, because it sounds like Michigan, I mean, obviously Michigan has a storied history when it comes to the automotive in industry, probably one of the most recognizable places around which the automotive industry has thrived in the past not doing so well at, at the current state by comparison, but then now we have this revitalized kind of look around technology and autonomous vehicles. And it, it seems like Michigan is becoming, you know, again, becoming a place to rally behind uh, for, for a number of reasons. Is it possible that that deals like this could revitalize Michigan's, uh, Michigan's economy in a significant way and kind of bring it back to where it once, where it once was or closer to where it once was? Yeah, I mean, certainly, um, you know, it never hurts to have a new company come in and bring new jobs into into the state. You know, whether it's Michigan or anywhere else, you know, it's 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 all that's always a good thing when when somebody is creating new business and employing more people. Yeah. Uh, so that you know, that's a good thing. Um, the one potential downside is that inevitably, you know, any of these kinds of deals, there's always big tax incentives that are given to a company. Uh, in order to entice them to to build in in your location in your state or or your city, um, you know, in the reports, you know, last week or the week before uh, the, about the, the announcement in Wisconsin with the LCD plant there, it was estimated that you know the the jobs that Foxconn would potentially be creating there would be costing the state as much as two hundred and thirty thousand dollars per job in tax incentives. You know, and that's that's not at all out of the out of the ordinary with a lot of these kinds of deals. You know, the the deal that uh, Faraday Future had made with the state of Nevada uh, to build a plant in North Las Vegas, you know, was along similar lines. Um, and so it all depends on how the deals, how these deals are structured. You know, every everywhere, you know, there's a, there's a new company coming in. There's deals like this. And depending on how the deals are structured, as long as the companies aren't necessarily given too much of the money up front. Um, then there's probably not too much downside. Uh, so, you know, it, it's important to make sure that they, um, you know, that they, they have some goals that they have to meet before they can get these incentives. Uh, so, for example, the Faraday case, you know, they, they essentially they recently bailed out on the plans to build in Las Vegas. And they just today announced uh, that they're going to be leasing a factory in California. Uh you know, they hadn't really done much of anything there. And the way that deal was set up with the state of, of Nevada, um, you know, basically Nevada hadn't really put out any money yet to Faraday. So they, they haven't lost very much um, as, it, as it is. So it, it all it all depends on the details.
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right on. Well, so um, before we go, I, I definitely want to make sure and mention you have a new column uh, in Automotive Engineering Magazine. Tell us a little bit about what you're going to be doing over there. Yeah, so um, I am started doing a monthly column for Automotive Engineering, which is the magazine of uh, the Society of Automotive Engineers. Um, it's You can get it, you can find it online at uh, sae.org. Um, and every month I'll be writing something about um, autom autonomous and connected vehicles, uh, something related to that. Uh, this uh, My first column this month uh, that just published last week uh, is about the recent um, Lexmark printer ruling in the Supreme Court uh, that more or less established um, the right to repair uh, as something being in law. So that, you know once a company sells uh, a product to consumers, uh, the consumers are allowed to do whatever they want with it. And so, you know, the column kind of takes a look at what are the potential impacts for automated driving um, and how this might uh, how, how this might affect the business of automated driving. Uh, that's fascinating because, I mean, there's going to be, yeah, I mean, people are so used to having the freedom to tinker with their cars. I mean, when you start to add in technology as this extra layer, does that change things? I guess does your article point out that, I mean, based on this ruling, it wouldn't, people still would be able to, what's the greater implication of something like well, that? Well, the, the greater implication is that, um, you know, un, under the, the law, under this ruling, people would be able to tinker with their cars, assuming they could actually purchase the vehicle. Yeah, there uh, is that. So what's, what I see being likely to, to happen. And, you know, I've, I've, this has been what I've been projecting for a while, but I think this kind of reinforces the idea that um, autonomous cars are not going to be something most people are ever going to be able to buy. They're only going to yeah. be available most likely through mobility services, mobility on demand services. So you, autonomous ride hailing. So think of it as, you know, Uber, Lyft, uh, but with autonomous vehicles um, so that you know, it's you, you're never you're never going to be you're never going to have the opportunity to own one of these vehicles. And since you don't own it, you can't mess with it. Right, right, right. Uh, well, Sam, I really appreciate you joining us today and, and telling us about these few stories here. Sam Boel, Samid, uh, Navigant Research, of course. And then now, of course, you can find his new column at Automotive Engineering uh, Magazine as well. Thank you, and Sam. And don't forget the Wheel Bearings podcast of as well, where, uh, where oh. Dan Roth and I talk about uh, cars and the future of transportation every week. You have a lot of stuff going on. Where can people find that podcast? Uh, at wheelbearings.media. Right on. Cool. Thanks again, Sam. We really appreciate it. And I hope that your your background, I hope that the, the weather outside of your window turns from <laughs> that green back to a nice blue. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right. Take care, Sam. See you later. Right, bye. <laughs> Uh, what, what can we say? You know, green screen, it's not easy. Uh, it's, it's amazing how it's amazing how the haze just rolled into that lake and rolled know, out like, so quickly. It's like it instantaneous. Like, uh, it's like you yeah, blink yeah, and there's the haze and then it's I gone. Thought, I thought the fog in San Francisco moved fast, but that's got nothing compared to Sam's haze. Yeah, so. most, most erratic <laughs> weather ever. Up next, a change to the echo that might just put you in the right mood, if you know what I mean. But first, let's take a minute to thank Eero, the sponsor of this episode. I've got three of them right here. You can install an enterprise-grade Wi-Fi system in your home in just a few minutes. It's like the easiest setup in the world. Uh, this is this is distributed Wi-Fi throughout your home. This is kind of the the premium pack. You get three full-size Eros, and it's just awesome. It's super easy. I love that the, the Wi-Fi mesh setup is such a big deal right now because it's definitely helped improve the Wi-Fi in my home. You simply download the Eero app, on your iOS or Android device. And then it's gonna walk you through each step of the process. And they really do make it quick and make it easy. It's painless. You can easily create and share a guest network. So if you have people coming over, you don't have to put them on your network. You can create a guest network for them. Uh, know how many devices are connected at any given point. Also, which devices are connected. You can check the internet speed that you're getting from your service provider through the app. Eero is protected with state-of-the-art WPA2 encryption. Eero updates automatically, so you're always going to have the latest features and improved security at all time. And now they are excited to introduce what I just showed you, the second generation Eero and Eero Beacon. Now, uh, Eero home Wi-Fi system started in early 2016. Since then, they've learned from hundreds of thousands of systems, making them smarter, making them faster and more reliable. The new Eero second generation and Eero Beacon allow a customer to build a Wi-Fi system that's more perfectly tailored for their home than ever before. They offer more speed and range and the same high quality elegant design that people have come to expect. 
With the addition of a third 5 gigahertz radio, the second generation Eero is now tri-band and as a result, it's twice as fast as its predecessor, which lets customers do more simultaneously in every room of the house, because that's what this mesh setup is all about. And with the addition of the new thread radio, Eero can connect to low power devices such as locks, doorbells, other sensors, and a whole lot more. Expanding your coverage in any room is easy. Uh, with Eero Beacon, you simply plug it into a wall and you're covered. It literally plugs into a wall. It has a nightlight built into it that you can set up. So it's kind of doing dual purpose. I have one in my bedroom. It's become the new <laughs> nightlight out in the front, but it's also extending our Wi-Fi. Uh, it works really well. Uh, you can add as many Eero Beacons as you want. If there's an outlet, literally, that's all you need. There's Wi-Fi. You just plug a beacon into it. And like I said, it's super easy to use. I think I had the whole system, two beacons, and the Eero set up in my home. I think it took me like 10 minutes total, beginning to end. And I remember when networking like this used to be super frustrating. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, for free overnight shipping, visit Eero.com. Uh, at checkout, you'll want to select overnight shipping and then enter TNT. That's going to make it free. So you're going to get it super fast. That's Eero.com. Enter code TNT, and we thank Eero for their support of Tech News Today. TNT's fan of the day is Todd Wiskowski, who sent us this picture. He actually sent emailed it to us, TNT at twit.tv, showing us his master control where he watches the show in his home. Good looking setup. Thank you for sending that in. We always really appreciate it. I, I can't tell. Are you drinking a beer or a soda and a yep. can koozie? It looks like it's a koozie. We yeah. definitely have a koozie there, and that looks to be like a beer. Uh, it might uh, say light. Is that a yeah. Miller Light? I don't know. Looks I don't like know. It. Looks like <laughs> it. What did you think, Burke? Oh, oh, Burke thinks it's a monster energy drink. Oh, it does look like the monster logo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. You got to be powered when you're when you're watching TNT. I get it. Sure. Uh, show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. Post it on Instagram. Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag how I watch TNT and we will find it. All right, finally, Amazon made an update to its Echo devices to include a new activities feature that ties into Amazon Music, that service you may or may not be using very much. Amazon built in 500 different activity utterances to encapsulate a number of different scenarios around which uh, you, a music playlist can be built. So you can play music for getting pumped, or you can play music for sleeping, or for those of you who really want to impress that special someone, you lower the lights, you pour a couple of glasses of wine, and you say, Echo, play baby-making music. And yep, <laughs> totally works. It works. Or so I'm told. I don't have an Echo, but Ron, what do you think? I, I think that it's a great interaction to add to add in like kind of you don't tell it what kind of music you want that said this reminds me of a complaint i have about google play music which is the service i use which they have the same kind they have like throughout the day when you go to google play music it's like oh look you're at home here's music to listen to at home or or it's early in the morning here's waking up music and they have a category of music called entering beast mode and yeah. i and I'm, i never will use the term beast mode you're never going to sit at home and yeah. turn to your wife and say, hey, let's play some baby making music like <laughs> like, no, no you're, like you're, you're right. You're right from, from the yeah, the, the idea is great and sound. The execution is a little off. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things that is funny to know that it's there. But yeah, you're right. You're probably never gonna. You're probably never gonna do that. I mean, it's it's one thing to say, like 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 hey, play play me some music to get excited, or play me some act. You know, like all those different terms. But no one is gonna say play me baby making music. Um, I know I'm focused in on that, but like that's the example. I'm never gonna. Oh, nice. Is there this, you go. Oh, is this baby making music too? Or <laughs> okay. Wow. See, hey, that's... you know what? It's a wide playlist. It, yeah. There there are many songs that would be classified as baby making music. Apparently, <laughs> true. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, hey, look, and, and don't don't fault us for covering the story. Amazon's the one that built it into their consumer hardware. Just saying. Yeah. Uh, but there you go. So if you have an Echo, now you can do that, and that's good to know. Uh, Ron, I really appreciate you coming on, especially because this was kind of last minute, and I totally appreciate it. Um, next time, actually, Bleak made us something so that next time I need to rope you in, I put in a link in the doc, uh, Brian. It's, it's right there underneath the sign-off. If I ever need to put the call out to you, Ron, I'm just going to put this in the sky. and There you go. And that'll be my Listen. call. 
Listen, I may not be the podcaster you want, but I'm the podcaster you need. <laughs> uh, you're both, Ron, as far as I'm concerned. In my book, you're all of the above. Uh, Ron Richards, well, where can people kind of follow all, all the stuff you're doing? Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Love being here with you, Jason. Uh, you can go follow me on Twitter at RonXO. That's where I've got links to my all my stuff, and you can see me talking about stuff throughout the days. Uh, but please, 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 if you like podcasts, go check out ifanboy.com, my other podcast where we're talking about comic books, much like we talked about earlier with Mark Miller. Um, we're talking about comic books and TV and movies and fun stuff there. And also check out my other podcast with Tom Merritt, uh, Damn Fine Podcast at damnfinepodcast.com, talking about Twin Peaks. So uh, try to keep busy. Follow me on Twitter. That's where you'll find everything. Radical. Thank you, Ron. Always a pleasure. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can always be part of the show by emailing us, tnt at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW and find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. You can always find all the ways to subscribe to the show if you go to twit.tv slash TNT. Everything's there that you're going to need to find. If you want to tweet at me, I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to our technical director and today's editor and occasional baby-making music player, Brian Burnett. Uh, with the shades. Wasn't expecting that. Uh, of course, it is very bright over there, so I understand. Uh, thanks to Burke for helping out in the studio, as always, an occasional Burke chat. Uh, and thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Hands up. Bam! Bam. Oh, sorry. I gave you a, a forehead <laughs> five. I walked into it. <laughs> <laughs>